Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Laya Greeno and I manage the Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group at Interaction, the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs. I'm happy to welcome you today to the to the seventh webinar in our Impact Evaluation Guidance Note and Webinar Series, which began this spring. The series, developed with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation, consists of four guidance notes on impact evaluation, each accompanied by two webinars. The focus of today's webinar is the fourth and final guidance note in the series, Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright. David is Chief Executive of Keystone Accountability, which seeks to improve the effectiveness of development organizations by developing new ways of planning, measuring, and communicating social change that are practical and include the voices of their beneficiaries and other constituents. Over the past three decades, David has worked as a grant maker and manager with the Aga Khan Foundation, Ford Foundation, Oak Foundation, and Ashoka, and has sought to evolve and test innovative approaches to strengthening citizen self-organization for sustainable development. As David writes in the conclusion to his guidance note, while the other notes in this series have focused on the why and how to of impact evaluation, this note is focused on the very important question of the so what, the what you do with the results. So I'll begin our session today with a short overview of the series, and then we'll turn it over to David for his presentation on the guidance note. The slides and webinar recording will be posted on Interaction's website afterwards. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, and then I'll conclude with some information about what is coming next. As those of you who've joined us for these webinars before know, the purpose of this guidance note and webinar series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. Our aim isn't to tell organizations exactly what to do, but to provide them with sufficient information so that they can make better decisions about impact evaluation. The four notes in the series are, Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Professor in Public Sector Evaluation at RMIT University in Australia. Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Bert Perrin, an independent consultant. Introduction to Mixed Methods and Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger. And Use of Impact Evaluation Results, which organizations identified as one of the greatest challenges they face in relation to, to impact evaluation, and I'm sure other types of evaluation as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, each guidance note in the series is accompanied by two webinars, one more theoretical, the other more focused on actual practice. In March, we launched the first guidance notes with a webinar in which Patricia Rogers gave a basic introduction to impact evaluation, and we followed that with a webinar featuring presentations from Allison Davids of Oxfam America, who focused on an impact evaluation of a program to prevent gender-based violence in El Salvador, as well as from Mulu Chekel and Larry Dershem of Save the Children, who prevented brief case studies of impact evaluations conducted in Palestine and Kazakhstan. In April, Bert Perrin presented an overview of the second note in the series, and Interaction members shared their experiences in the webinar that followed, with John Kurtz of Mercy Corps presenting on how the organization has used existing data from program m and &E and secondary sources as part of a recent impact evaluation, and Celeste Lemro of Africare presenting on how monitoring data influenced the direction of impact evaluations of programs in Ghana and Niger. Our fifth webinar in September was with Michael Bamberger, who presented on the third guidance note on mixed methods. In the following webinar, Jeannie Anon of the International Rescue Committee and Megan Gash of Freedom from Hunger presented examples of mixed methods impact evaluations at their organizations involving programs in Thailand and Mali. The notes, along with the recordings and presentations from all of these webinars, are posted on Interaction's website as they're developed at the link you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, as you can see, the first three guidance notes and materials from the six webinars we've had to date have already been posted. Um, we've also posted answers to the questions we received from webinar participants. Um, and we also have been posting the translations of each note 
as they're made available. Um, each note is being translated into French, Spanish, and Arabic, um, so please do share these with your staff and colleagues in the field. Before I turn it over to David, um, I just wanted to, to provide some instructions about how this webinar technology works. If you'd like to minimize or maximize this webinar screen, just click on the orange arrow. You can view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking on the blue box below that. Um, due to the large number of participants, you'll remain on mute for the rest of the webinar, but if you have any questions, um, please type it in the question box. I'll be monitoring questions throughout David's presentation, so please feel free to send them to me as you think of them. Um, and David, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Laya, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining this um, this uh, this webinar. Let me just click the show my screen button so that you guys can see this. Uh, have I succeeded? You have. Okay, let's go to... Perfect. Okay. Um, so in this, for the first part of this, I'm going to kind of walk through what's in the notes um, and uh, for about 20 minutes or so using a few slides. Um, the note's pretty short and uh, maybe a lot of you have it there in front of you. Um, so uh, I don't want to be super repetitive. I'll just try to kind of um, first tell you a little bit about uh, how, we, how, we, how we wrote the note. And uh, it was a pretty interactive uh, process. And uh, while my name is there as the author, in a very real sense, it's a, a, a real effort of many people and, and hundreds of conversations and a survey and all that. And then I'll go through the main themes. We tried to organize the, the note into, into three pretty simple themes, um, and I'll go through those. OK, first on the, um, there we go. Um, we, we use what I, what I like to think of as a kind of a inductive approach, which was to try to figure out um, how your organizations are um, finding effective ways to use evaluation findings and especially impact evaluation findings. And, and so we started by asking folks around, you know, kind of what at various about attitudes toward, um, toward utilizing evaluations and uh, following up with more detailed interviews with folks who put their hands up and said they'd be prepared to, to talk in more depth about that. We did 11 interviews in the end of about an hour or sometimes longer each uh, following the, the survey. And thanks to anyone on the call who participated in either the interviews or the survey. Um, and then from that, we, we uh, also did a literature review um, and drew from our own experience to try to come up with the kind of the main uh, findings and the argument in the, in the report. Um, when it comes to findings, there's, there's, I think, quite a constructive and appropriate dissatisfaction with the current state of practice. Um, I mean, the, that's the negative way of stating it. The positive way of stating it is that there's an appetite to improve. There's an appreciation of the importance, and it comes through quite strongly. In my work, uh, which cuts across both the domestic uh, uh, organizations in a number of countries as well as in the international development domain, um, I found that international development organizations generally are more uh, engaged uh, on these issues than uh, domestically oriented organizations. That's not universally true, but I think on average it is true. And and so while we're not we're not in a great place, we're not where we need to be on uh, utilizing evaluation. Um, we know it, and we want to improve, and that's important. Um, people identified clear patterns in the constraints on use, and the, the first one begins with a, a lack of clarity over purposes and the value of, of uh, evaluation. And I, I think when you when you dig deeper on that, we'll talk a little bit about clarifying purpose. But I think it has to do with some of the themes in this report about using evaluations, which are that we don't have. Uh, good systems that are, enable us to use findings well, and therefore we feel frustrated around uh, using them and feel there's a lack of clarity. 
Um, this is uh, the second reason that comes up again and again is lack of know-how and systems to do impact evaluations, let alone use them. Um, and again, this goes back to the fact that we're in this kind of emergent stage on this practice. The third important theme is, is really the relative lack of donor support for impact evaluation. And by that, I don't mean that donors aren't asking for it. They are. But they don't themselves have the capability and aren't consistently providing smart resources to enable it. And so while donors might be very enabling of certain kinds of practice, evaluation is not one of them. And there's a number of studies now that have come out, surveys, uh, that have shown uh, this to be true. And I cite those in the, in the report. Um, and lastly, the one that we, we don't talk about too much, but we sometimes whisper and certainly uh, are aware of in the wee hours when we're trying to sleep and can't sleep, which is we do worry about the consequences of finding out that our programs aren't having uh, real effects that can be measured. And, um, and so maybe, gosh, if, if we aren't having impacts, maybe it's better not to know. Or if negative findings come out, what's its impact going to be on my funding and so on. And so there is that overall climate that I think there's a kind of a risk embedded in evaluation that we need to address and resolve in order to get to effective utilization. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the report. This, is, this slide um, shows the results from the survey on attitudes toward impact evaluation. And what we did in this graph is cluster the respondents into three categories, what we call the promoters in the light, uh, the light tan color, the passives, people who are kind of on the fence in the blue color, and then the detractors in the bright orange color. And as you can see, the only question where there's a significant uh, number of promoters is the question that uh, people agree with the statement that impact evaluations that we do uh, cause no harm. Um, and so it's a, it's a kind of a faint, faint praise. Uh, when it comes to all the other statements, um, the, the, uh, the, the, we're in the negative uh, net promoter score world where there's no positive net promoter scores. And, uh, at, the, at the best, you have a lot of passives. But for statements like, for example, um, uh, how friendly are the, uh, how user friendly are the reports that cross your desk? People are not finding them at all user friendly. Um, or my organization emphasizes the use of evaluation findings. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, people are saying, no, that's not the case. Um, and in case you think that that these scores might be, uh, uh, you know, uh, too uh, negative, and that the that the survey respondents maybe are are tougher than. Uh, there's a question like, is is there some self selection here? What's the selection bias, and who chose to respond to our survey? Um, my my reading of that is, and this is we can debate it, but my my reading is that. The people who answered this are probably on the more positive side toward impact evaluation. They took the time out to spend an hour. They're, we sent the survey, by the way, to the members of the Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group of Interaction, about 300 plus folks, and had about a 16.1 response rate, uh, percent response rate. So of, the, of that 300 or so, 16% uh, took the trouble to spend 40 minutes or so answering this survey. And my, my uh, guess is, my working hypothesis is that they tend to be on the positive side. Um, and, and so the reality out there is even more negative than what you're seeing here um, in terms of uh, how people are feeling about uh, the utility of impact evaluations and, and how well the uh, the impact evaluations are, are kind of landing in organizations. Okay, let's let's move on now from kind of setting the scene to um, the themes uh, in the in the report. There's three themes, um, and uh, the first one is is that um, really that use use is for users, and that the more prepared you are. Uh, 
early and the earlier you are prepared in terms of working with users and engaging with users to uh, be ready to use uh, the findings, the more likely it is that you are going to, um, to have effective use. And so it's too late. You've already lost if you wait to, uh, till, the, till the evaluation report lands on your desk. Uh, and you're expecting good utilization, it actually begins uh, right when you're conceptualizing the evaluation. And what we're recommending is that you um, actually start by mapping out who are the potential users and, 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 and then correlating their alignment with the purpose that you have for the evaluation. And you've worked through your purpose on the evaluation. That's usually purposes. And you start to match those purposes against the users. And if you think about it, one of the characteristics of international development organizations is the high diversity of the constituencies that we're accountable to. So at a minimum, you're talking staff, board, uh, intended beneficiaries, partners, including potential governments that are in the areas where you're working, um, funders, policymakers, uh, and then you can go wider and look at media, academia, peers, uh, and society at large. And and if you take a systematic approach toward looking across those and you say, okay, what are the possible uses uh, of the findings from this evaluation to these different users and kind of plot it almost on a heat map in terms of how, how important the uses are likely to be or the findings are likely to be those different users, you start to have a sense of where, what you need to be ready for when the evaluation findings come out. Um, and, um, and also it's not just about kind of having findings land as if from another planet and start to use them, it actually, um, it, it arrives in a, in a process where if you engage with your users even before you go out and start to collect data, uh, in a, and this, this graph here now is a, this image is of a kind of a closed loop learning model where you begin in the planning fr uh, stage by framing consultations with your different users and understand how they are seeing the questions that you're looking at and the kind of indicators that you're likely to get. And, and, and in a sense, fine tune their appetite for those. And then you go out and do your investigation and analyze the data as it comes in. And then you go back in a pre-final mode to kind of what I call validating conversate consultations, where you kind of show people what it is that's emerging in the data and how they interpret that and how they understand it and give them a chance to develop some ownership with respect to those before they're in a kind of final form. Um, and that helps you kind of uh, concretize what you're, what you're hearing in the evaluation. And then uh, you move into the reporting and the improvement stages, and then the cycle begins all over again. Um, and uh, one of the really great things about um, good impact evaluations is that they generate great questions. They never they never uh, conclude, they very, very con rarely conclude anything. They mostly sharpen your questions and, and, and sharpen your thinking. And so um, it, what's terrific in that validating consultations and even in the report stage when you're starting to share the actual findings is to go back with the questions that have been opened up uh, in the evaluation and let people engage around those. Great questions produce great dialogues. And so um, it's really important to kind of capture the potential energy, the social energy that's there you know, that can come out of an evaluation. It's actually very exciting and, um, and can be, uh, I think, about the most, ex the most dynamic part of the whole process is when uh, tough, important, interesting questions emerge from an evaluation. You can go back and discuss those under the guise of sharing findings. Okay. Um, I just, this slide, I'm not going to talk through all these points. But what this slide is really to say, there's a lot of craft out there about how you can communicate knowledge, how you share knowledge with people. That, that, um, that uh, going back to that question about how uh, in, the, in the survey, that people, the, the most negative response we got in the survey was to the user friendliness of evaluation reports. And you know that it's not the job of the evaluator by by herself or himself to produce user friendly material. It's it's our collective job, all of us associated with the process of an evaluation, to figure out um, 
how to take what's emerging there in the way of knowledge and communicate it to where it needs to be for learning to happen. And so I put this slide up here, and it's, it's referenced uh, to its source in the uh, report, and there's a huge literature around this that we point to that essentially says there's a, there's, it's important to put time and energy into um, crafting ways to communicate the knowledge that comes out. And, um, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, it was interesting in the interviews, um, I did a kind of cross check and as people talked about things that they'd done that's been effective, I would kind of tick off things from this list that people were describing. And so these are practices that people are doing. I don't think people, though, are sitting systematically with checklists on their desks as much as they should and saying, okay, with this evaluation, which of these techniques are we using for which knowledge, knowledge elements and how are we going to get them to which audiences, which I think is the kind of rigor and planning level that we're, we're starting to call for in this paper. Okay. Um, so that's kind of theme one. Theme, theme, and I hope that everyone's feeling maybe a little bit daunted uh, by that um, and challenged by it, but, but I really think that's what it takes, that if you don't get it in the early from the very beginning and start to think about these things and, and invest the resources that are required to really break down evaluation reports into forms, bite-sized parts that people can deal with and advance with and learn from, um, you won't get anything like the value that's, uh, that's, that's embedded in a good evaluation. Um, and so feel daunted, I hope, a little challenged, but also determined to maybe try some of these things the next time uh, a cycle comes around and your evaluation comes up. Okay, so now we're going to move on to theme two. And um, theme two, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on uh, President Clinton's famous line from his, uh, his uh, election campaign, it's the economy stupid, or was it, maybe it wasn't Clinton, maybe it was Bush, uh, Bush won. Um, I'm no, not remembering, but anyway, my, my version of this is it's your operating system. And, and, uh, and the point here is that delivering the right findings in the right form at the right time puts demands on our organizational systems of different kinds. And if we haven't anticipated those demands and figured out how to join up field operations with advocacy activities and strategy development and communications activities and fundraising activities, we won't realize the impact we want from the findings. We won't be able to utilize the findings well. So it requires a joined up approach. And as we worked, we found a number of constraints to this. So um, one of them, and, and it just that the way this plays out is that impact evaluation definitely creates pressures across the organization and on the systems. And the, 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 the more, the larger an organization is, the more complex it is, the more decentralized it is, the harder it is to, to join up and connect the dots when it comes to evaluations. Another is that um, utilizing impact evaluation and indeed doing impact evaluation puts generally puts burdens on staff that go inadequately recognized um, in the sense, and what I mean by that is that um, evaluation, participation in both the doing of and the, um, you know, supporting an evaluation process that's going on and, um, and, uh, and participating actively in the utilization of findings um, is generally not built into people's uh, time uh, management, normal time management loads. And so it comes as an extra burden. There, there's always a burden with whatever we do, but this comes as an extra burden. We've heard that again and again, and it's in the literature, and we need to start to plan for it and understand what it takes if we're going to do this well. Um, and so when it comes to then thinking positively about the recommendations, uh, the first one is uh, that we've got to track um, uh, the, uh, the utilization of findings into our ordinary management systems. You know, everyone has heard the old cliche, you know, what's get, what gets measured gets managed. So we need to develop simple um, metrics 
costs of utilization of every evaluation that gets done and then track those and review them in the normal performance management system of an organization so that um, it, it's up there with all the other uh, items that are on an organization's uh, regular kind of scorecard or uh, 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 tracking, management tracking system, whatever it happens to be. Really, really critical. Um, I think if there's one practice that would have the biggest impact on impact uh, on, on evaluation use, it would be uh, to um, track use, to actually measure it carefully and discuss it. Um, the second one, I want to give a shout out to a recently released Millennium Challenge Corporation report on, uh, it was a review of the first five impact evaluations that they had uh, commissioned in the agricultural space. And it came out about the 10th of October, just as we were going to press. And um, in it, they draw some lessons uh, and um, they're quite practical and they're very nicely described in terms of the experience that came out of these evaluations. And I just want to give it a big shout out. The, the, uh, and I, we didn't coordinate and I hadn't seen this report when we, when we had put this, with this report, our report had gone to bed before the MCC one came out. But their lessons really closely tracked what we're saying in this uh, in this uh, note, and one of the most important ones was in with respect. There was lesson number two for them was engage early and communicate often, and they're talking specifically about um, the communications between the evaluation team, the evaluators, and staff. Uh, but it goes broadly to uh, communications, to getting ready to communicate with with uh, about findings down the road. And they ran into quite a lot of problems with intentions between the implementation of the evaluation and the running of the program. And I, I really commend uh, them for producing such a kind of warts and all hard look at uh, how those evaluations went. Two of them actually they considered to be failures because they couldn't actually complete the evaluations because the evaluators and the implementers of the projects just couldn't find the common ground. And they've developed some really good practical solutions out of that. So I want to I want to give that uh, that report a, a shout out and encourage it to all you. It's called um, Impact Evaluations of Agricultural Projects, and I'm sure it's easy to find on the MCC website. Um, the uh, the other thing I would say is that, uh, and they emphasize this in their report as well, is that. Um, if, 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 if making time for staff is important and recognizing the time that is taken associated with evaluations, another part of that in going further is actually training and preparing and building staff capacity to do this. And um, that goes back to one of the early constraints that was mentioned when we initially talked with people, the concern about capacity. And so this is something that, uh, that there is a need for training in. This is an area that's underfunded. And uh, and so we're trying to call we call we call that out in the in the report. Um, okay, um, I the, that that section of the um, report was summarized in this checklist. And I I think frankly, if you were just going to pull one page out from the report and only use that, you could you could get away with this. Um, it it really is. Uh, I think it kind of it's not just a summary of what's in there. There's some forward-looking things that aren't in the in the actual report that I kind of teased out into this checklist. And it's meant to be a very practical uh, kind of you know steps that you can just follow through on on uh, each phase of of a uh, utilizing an impact evaluation. I just want to mention the last two. Um, I think it's a you know it's it's ironic that we invest a massive amount of resources in doing evaluation and then we we don't invest any resources into assessing how well we did with the evaluation, which is one of the reasons this MCC report I just mentioned is so important, because they spent a lot of time and energy producing that study of the five studies. Um, but I'm suggesting something that's very simple, that's really easy to do here in steps 11 and 12, which is simply find out um, say a month after an evaluation has been reported and you've undertaken some communications activities to different stakeholder groups, to just find out what the awareness level is about the findings. 
um, and, and to also maybe find out what's being done by people that might be different. It's literally two questions uh, that you could ask and, uh, and get an answer to. Uh, and then again, six months later, and see uh, the difference uh, and see what, you know, what, the, what the trajectory is. Um, and if you do that rigorously with every evaluation that you'll do, you'll start to see some important patterns and learn some things about how to improve uh, use. Okay, um, so now we come to theme three. And I summarize theme three as incentives, incentives, incentives. It's really, the, the, the fact is that we, that doing impact evaluations and utilizing impact evaluations is, requires great effort. I think if there's one, uh, uh, one takeaway from, from the four, uh, <laughs> the four uh, guidance notes, that's it. This is serious stuff. It takes a huge amount of work. And if you step back and look at how the incentives are poised in the world that we live in, um, they're not there that are sufficiently to justify the level of effort that's required to do this well. And so in, my theme three is that we really have to strengthen the incentives um, in order to get good at this. Uh, and we need um, more, uh, more incentives. I, I, I'm a big fan of the of the organizational learning theorist Edgar Schein, who has this theory of organizational learning that basically says that um, organizations learn when they have survival anxiety, which overcomes um, the other anxieties they have about uh, learning. And so um, we need to kind of ramp up our survival anxiety in order to, to be better learners. And, um, and the good news is that there are some things that are, are giving us existential worry. Um, and uh, we, we're living in a, glow, a, a climate of growing accountability, I think. We're, we're all feeling greater ac accountability demands. And some of those demands are pushing us in the right direction in terms of getting better at being, at measuring and managing to the results that we actually achieve. Um, and so that's a good thing. Um, I also think another positive development is the general trend toward greater professional management and utilization of, of uh, uh, evidence to make decisions. And I think this is very clear, uh, especially if you take a, a 30 year or so uh, time frame, uh, which is the one that I use because that's how long I've been working in development. And I, I can tell you that for the first decade when I was working in development, there was almost zero uh, uh, time and effort spent on collecting and reflecting on good evidence of results. And in the previous, in the next 10 years, it was just emerging. And in the last 10 years, it's really started to come alive. And that's exciting. And, uh, and I think it's a trend in the right direction. The third and maybe most powerful driver here is the internet. The internet's kind of a wrecking ball through this space because it makes, and, and new communications technologies more generally, ICTs, they're making it much easier uh, to uh, get good evidence and to share it. And that means that more people will look at it and hold us accountable for it. And uh, that's all to the good. Transparency is a big driver here, but also these uh, information tools, software tools that make it easier to do. Um, I guess everyone's familiar with the trend toward pay for success that's starting to emerge. So funding is starting to get aligned around results. And more and more examples of that are, are coming up. Um, uh, that we know about. And um, uh, uh, another area is that um, uh, rating organizations are starting to focus on results. I think probably most people are aware that Charity Navigator, the biggest charity rating agency in the U.S., has announced that it's introducing next year a, a, a new rating dimension that's based on how organizations report their results. Um, so that's coming and, and um, uh, as well. And I think anybody who's getting government money is seeing uh, increasing uh, demands from both the Congress and the administrative agencies to uh, do a better job of measuring. Last year in the Foreign Appropriations Bill, there was a call for um, USAID to begin reporting beneficiary feedback from humanitarian programs. That bill hasn't passed into law yet. I mentioned it in the report. But I think it's a sign of the times and it's where it's going. 
uh, Congress is is making more and more noise about this, and uh, and some of the domestic. Uh, this is actually an area where I think some of the domestic programs are further along than uh, than international, but um, uh, but we'll see that bleed across into the de into demands on international organizations. Okay. Um, so the second part of the uh, part of the response to as we get more incentives and as we are are pressured to uh, to do a better job of, of uh, accounting to our results. Um, the way we'll get there is by actively cultivating a learning culture. So this is the positive side, and um, learning cultures get um, get created when leaders uh, build them. And so obviously leadership buy-in is really critical. And um, one of the interesting little footnotes in this whole journey is that the organizations that seem to be making the most headway with impact evaluation are the ones that have more discretionary resource and, and, and leadership that's bought into this. So they're using their discretionary funding to do the evaluations and kind of try to get ahead of the curve. And that's, that's exciting and I think a good sign of the time. So leadership buy-in is critical. Um, and the way to start, I think, is by just doing a kind of audit of your current learning culture. Um, look across it and look at what are the incentives and disincentives for learning in your organization and develop a map toward building uh, a stronger learning culture and more learning practices and that that means creating formal spaces for learning and I mean I'm I feel like I'm um, you know I'm kind of uh, you know teaching a monkey to make a face here but but because uh, I think most NGOs are really good at at uh, carving out space for this, but it needs to be said, this is critical. It doesn't happen by accident. You need to create the spaces. They need to be regular. They need to be recognized. Um, and, and the conversations have to happen. It can't be left to the water cooler and the odd chance that someone's going to read an evaluation report and two people are going to talk about it. Um, the other uh, side of this, the positive side, is, is reward learning. Um, so you know, really, really, uh, the, the Hewlett has a foundation. A Hewlett Foundation has an award for the for the biggest failure every year uh, in a grant. But when you when you actually open that up uh, and look at what they're doing, they're actually uh, rewarding the kind of biggest the biggest learning experience out of a, a failure in a grant. And I think um, you know we need to do a lot more of that uh, and create that that culture that says it's okay to, to uh, take risks and as long as you learn things when, uh, from what you're doing. Um, and then finally, it needs to be landed in, uh, in performance appraisals and, uh, and people's job descriptions and so on. Not, uh, not to be graded down when things don't uh, go well, but, but rather to recognize again uh, the importance of, uh, of learning. It's a positive, not a negative. Um, Okay, last slide. Um, the the uh, the you know I think that the true gold standard of impact evaluation is not um, any methodology or even mixed methodology. It's um, it's use. Uh, that's the point. Uh, the point of these evaluations is that they're used, that they make a difference in the world, and so uh, the true gold standard of impact evaluation is use. And if we're going to take uh, evaluation use seriously, we need some field level tools that will help us do that. So I, 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 I close the piece by calling for a project to benchmark um, use metrics. And it, it would be very, very easy to do and it would go something like this. Uh, get 10 organizations together who would agree um, uh, the fees and the rules of engagement based on confidentiality, transparency, and inclusion to develop a kind of, you know, in other words, how you're going to pay for it and how you're going to uh, how you're going to kind of use the use the metrics and and basically what's involved is you agree some um, indicators on evaluation use that you would all track and then report into uh, a common data set so that you have benchmarks against each other uh, around those and obviously lots of great questions and learning conversations will flow from that. And then everybody reports out on how well they're doing so that it creates that, that wider accountability within their organizations to improvement. Um, and uh, uh, periodic reflection and analysis and exchange of experiences. 
really easy, um, very powerful, um, and all of a sudden we now have a field lever conversation about how well we're using evaluations. And we, it's the kind of next step beyond uh, periodic thoughtful reviews by a single organization of a set of evaluations as uh, MCC has just done in that report. So I, I kind of see this as the, as the next step. So that's that's it on uh, on the presentation, um, Laya. Well, I guess over to you. Thanks very much, David. Um, let me switch back to to me very quickly. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to to remind everyone that if you have a question, please type it in this question box here. We do already have a number of questions, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, just a quick note, though, the, I sent a link to the paper from the MCC that David referenced to everyone um, through the chat box, so you should have that there. Um, and thanks for, for the person who sent me that link. Um, so the, the first couple of questions, David, um, are first, I think, which is a common concern, um, how can impact evaluation findings best inform the project, given that the timing of impact evaluations are towards the end of the project and reports are completed almost always after the project has ended? Um, and then a second question, not, not related, uh, but, but goes to your um, comment that you need to engage in conversations with stakeholders often and early, um, is that great questions and evaluation may be perceived as a great threat or offense by some stakeholders. What should be done in such cases? Okay, thank you. Well, so on the first one, um, I think if you, uh, if you think of, I, I think that it's um, oftentimes an impact, a true impact evaluation the actual final report is really aimed at the future and and therefore isn't all that helpful to the project in the present. Um, however, having said that, if throughout the entire course of the evaluation from the beginning of the project, and which is when the evaluation ideally is starting to be framed, you're engaging in a kind of a uh, in a smart way with the, mon the normal monitoring activities, you can begin to thread in uh, the data that's coming through the evaluation alongside monitoring data and, and be setting up uh, you know, periodic reflections on what's emerging uh, all along the way. And so it can be useful. Uh, along the way, if you're engaging with the different stakeholders uh, around the, the uh, things that are emerging in the evaluation, even the framings uh, and the questions tend, can be really useful for the project. You know, the, what, what evaluators often do is help you really clarify what's measurable and what's not. Um, and it's okay to carry on with things that maybe won't be measurable, but uh, having more people understand the, 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 the things in your project that will be measured will help the project in its implementation. So um, I think that's, that's kind of the, how I think about the, the optimizing the present value for improvement in real time is through that intensive engagement during the impact evaluation, but recognizing that some of the big values of impact evaluation are going to be forward-looking to the subsequent phases of the project or other projects and indeed learning by all stakeholders that they carry forward wherever they go. Um, second question, um, Nalaya, was, remind me? Um, that, that great questions in an evaluation may be perceived as a great oh, threat. Yeah. Um, Threatening, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So that's, um, it's really important there to um, try to present questions that are emerging in as constructive and positive a way as possible, which is not to say you gloss over the, the kind of threat that may be, or the, the issue that may be um, tough in, in what's coming out, or the questions that are emerging, but, you know, if, if something is genuine and real, and the question is an important question that is not being addressed, or that people need to think about, then, you know, it's the job of program staff and the evaluator to 
get that out to people to let them come to terms with the threat. So, um, you know, I guess I guess I go back to that old cliche: straight talk breaks no friendships. Thanks, David. Um, the the next couple of questions are related and kind of are pushing back a little bit on the the recommendation to incorporate findings into into management meetings, um, and and both of of these participants note that that can be a little bit difficult. Um, the first person notes that evaluation specialists, maybe particularly in humanitarian organizations, but certainly this could be true in others as well, have no systematic access to management meetings or even management. So in this situation, what is the next best thing? Um, and, and taking the effort to, to get management's attention without a systematic channel can be exhausting. The second person also notes that incorporating IE findings into management meetings can be very challenging um, and, and notes that management sometimes have a desire to censor the findings before they're presented before management meetings. So could you comment on, on these observations of, around this recommendation in particular? Yeah, first just to say those are both great questions and, and really also observations. Um, and the first question prompts me to, to say something I wanted to say uh, and it came through in our research for this and maybe should be more strongly in the report, which is um, properly done uh, evaluations, and here I'm going to go beyond impact evaluations to think of other kinds of evaluations as well, can be incredibly empowering for frontline staff because because once um, my our, what we hear again and again and we see again and again is that frontline staff are actually very aware of what's working and what's not and what's actually happening and they they often find that evaluations are very very affirming of what they see it describes the world that they are actually seeing and that what happens is that those uh, though that that clear that that, that kind of uh, very similar picture of the world that they're facing gets diluted and distorted as it moves up the organization and lands and other competing interests start to uh, play out. And so, I think that if you think about this as the kind of um, getting high fidelity to uh, good evidence of experience on the ground up through an organization so that you get smarter decisions around uh, at all levels, that, that, that uh, this works in favor of, of uh, the position of frontline staff in terms of the power equation. And so um, I, I think it, it, it does support my recommendation, which is that uh, if, if the finding, if, especially if you're, you're tracking use, uh, in in management meetings, um, so are you know to what extent are certain recommendations actually being uh, implemented, and to what extent is new evidence coming up that's showing that that's making a difference, and if that becomes part of the conversation, that strengthens uh, the hand of people who may not have regular access to um, management uh, meetings and indeed uh, the way in which funding gets uh, organized because oftentimes organizations can't change what they're doing even though it's very clear to everybody on the ground that that's not what's wanted it's not what's working but you can't change it because actually the money came for some other purpose and there's nothing we can do about that but if you have strong evidence it just helps you move the whole system all the way up to the construction and allocation of resource so that it's more aligned so I guess that's a partly satisfactory answer, I hope, to the first point. Um, re re refresh my memory on the second point again. The, the second point um, was that, that senior management can also, or, or management might also be tempted to censor the findings before they're presented at management meetings. Um, and this actually relates to a question that has just come in. Um, which is, what do you consider good practices for communi communicating impact evaluations to outside audiences between cherry picking favorable findings and being 100% transparent? Um, 
Right. So, you know, part of the problem is that um, there's so much at stake uh, by the time, the, the, if you think about an impact evaluation, there's nothing more than a bound final 200 page document with reams of data behind it and, and thousands of hours of analysis over three years. Um, then you've, you've kind of, you're in trouble. You've lost in a sense because th there's going to be so much at stake around that and it's always going to get politicized and not used well. And so we're kind of arguing here, and I think it's throughout all four guidance notes, that you have to break down impact evaluation into more of a process of evaluative activities, which aggregate to some really valid evidentiary based conclusions about program effects, but also along the way generate lots of insights and lessons and actionable um, moments and hopefully learning. And so um, I'm really arguing for that different paradigm and way of thinking about evaluation so that, you know, yes, some final product might get cherry picked and certain senior staff are threatened by something and they'll, they'll put it in a shelf. But if the whole process leading up to it has had many consultations with diverse stakeholders and there have been many discussions along the way of findings and so on, you'll still have eked out a lot of value and maybe you've made the adjustments that need to be made and, and the learning that needs to happen around that evaluation is done and the final report is not all that relevant uh, because you're already there. Um, so I guess that's my answer to the question. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, it's ever a good, good idea for people to censor. I, I think that, um, well, let me, let me, uh, <laughs> I actually having said that, I, I'm feeling slightly hypocritical because I did bury a study once. Um, and I'm thinking back to the concept. I did it because um, uh, the findings were so devastating that had we published it, I think it would have set things back a decade in that particular country. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I think actually that when I think back on that experience, it validates what I just said about the, the process because we got, what we did instead was we took, the, we, we took the findings and we broke them out into small pieces and we um, workshopped those across the country and, and got the, the discussions going to try to move that forward and we raised everyone's awareness about the problem without publishing the study. Um, uh, so I guess, what am I saying? I guess I'm saying that it's inevitable that senior managers will sometimes make those kinds of decisions, but that if you've done the evaluation in a very consultative, highly interactive way throughout, uh, you will have already achieved a lot of the value that you need to get from, uh, from the Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to, to post a couple more questions up. Um, so the next question is that you suggested that it's not the evaluator's job to produce uh, user-friendly products. Whose job is it then specifically? And what are the risks of non-evaluators creating products based on potentially selective use of evaluation findings? That's a great. That's another great question, and that came up in our in our interviews. Uh, uh, very the the problem of um, translation, law, getting things getting really lost in translation. Um, I I I'm not saying that the I, I what I should have said was that it's not the evaluator's responsibility alone, and the people who oftentimes in my experience people who are really good at doing impact evaluations aren't necessarily uh, great at developing a range of diverse communication products that accurately reflect those findings but then make them um, digestible to different audiences. So I, I guess I'm calling for a team approach and it's, 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 I'm saying it's everyone's job that, that this really needs to get done and you need to bring in people who are skilled at communications and good at writing and who understand the particular audience you want to reach and um, you know so I, I think it's, it's about putting together the 
the skill sets that are required to uh, ensure that the value that's there in an evaluation gets gets communicated out in ways that people can relate to. Um, and uh, and and it, again, this is a uh, it's a culture thing. You know, if you have the culture in your organization to make sure people understand you, uh, you'll find the ways to 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 take these documents and rework them. So we're, we're about out of time, but I will pose um, w one last question or a couple of, of questions that, that touch on other, other factors that affect evaluation use. So one of those um, is the, the credibility of the evaluation itself. Um, this person notes that his experience is that users tend to use the findings when they believe the evaluation is credible. What is your view of that? And then someone else points to a couple of other factors that affect use. One being the placement of the evaluation unit in the organization. And second, the resources for the evaluation unit. Um, so if you have any comments on those three factors, credibility, placement of the evaluation unit, or resources for the evaluation unit, and how those affect use. Mm -hmm. Well, credibility is critical. The, I'm assuming that we, I'm starting, my starting point is that you have a credible evaluation that's been done in a rigorous way, that's generated valid evidence, that's con drawing conclusions that are substantiated in the, in the data. Um, and well argued, so it's really important. Um, and uh, as far as, so the second the second factor was where it's located in the organization, mm -hmm. and how much resources it has. Right. Well, again, I think you know, in, in following theme two, you have to have a joined up approach to utilizing evaluations. So. Um, it really is a, a question of creating cross-functional teams. Um, and as far as the overall responsibility, um, I don't think it matters as long as you're tracking use and it's landing in the kind of management score cards that CEOs and boards see. So if a board is seeing on its scorecard that you are at 25% on utilization of evaluations, that will hopefully light a fire under the team, and uh, and get you know higher levels of utilization going forward. So I think it's about it's about a performance management system that actually measures and pushes it right up to the top. Um, and as far as resource goes, I think uh, it's just it's chronically underfunded this piece, uh, and. Um, and so uh, I think there's a there's a kind of a real job to be done to make the business case for for a better investments in effective uh, conducting and utilizing of, of uh, all kinds of evaluations. I think this is an area where you know what we're doing we're not doing as well as we should, not getting the value from it, and we're not and because of that we can't seem to justify doing more of it because what we're doing isn't all that good, and so. We're kind of caught in a in a mediocre cycle. I think some organizations have broken out of that and started to demonstrate real value um, from evaluation. And I think the key is is in this idea of really deriving more value from all aspects of the evaluation. You know, personally, I've I've gotten the most value from evaluations more at the front end when evaluators come in in the planning stage and they really force you to sharpen your thinking. If you get that right from the beginning, then there won't be a lot of surprises later when you do, uh, you know, an independent evaluation. So, and I think that then that you know, so if you if you kind of break it down and, and are utilizing evaluation across the entire operational cycle, from planning through to implementing and then finally uh, uh, reviewing, then you'll be able to make the case to invest more in it. Great. Well, we are technically out of time, um, but I, I do want to mention a few things about what's coming next. And David, again, thanks very much for your presentation and for the for your your recommendations on how people can make progress on this very challenging issue. Um, so, so we are out of time, but 
but if you do have additional questions for David, please send me an email at lgrino at interaction.org by Monday, November 26. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible and we'll post the responses on Interaction's website. And if you have examples of how your organization promotes the use of impact evaluation results or evaluation utilization more generally, um, please, please send those to me as well. It'd be interesting to aggregate those. Uh, next, I want to mention and remind everyone that our next and last webinar in this series will be next Wednesday, November 28th at 11 a.m. DC time. That webinar will feature presentations from Ox Oxfam GB and the Millennium, Millennium Challenge Corporation on their efforts to promote impact evaluation results. The presenters for the webinar will be Carl Hughes, Program Effectiveness Team Lead with Oxfam GB, Jennifer Sturdy, Associate Director of Impact Evaluation at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and Catherine Farley, Senior Director of Agriculture and Land in the Department of Com Compact Operations at the MCC. And both Oxfam GB and the MCC recently released the results of some impact evaluations, so they, they'll have some really interesting insights to share. Um, Information on how to register for that webinar is Interaction's website at the link on the bottom of your screen. And this is the same place where you'll find the guidance notes, webinar recordings, and presentation slides from everything done in the series so far. Um, so thanks again to everyone for your participation, and I hope you'll join us on the 28th. Thanks very much.